Okay. Okay. Well, welcome to the March meeting of the CSI Next Chapter. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the virtual chapter is I'm located in Columbus, Ohio. Lori, Lori is located somewhere in Michigan. Cindy is somewhere in Texas. Uh, we're all organizing this meeting to get it out to you folks. Today, I'm attending a bag stuffing for our trade show, which happens on Monday. We have 297 people registered as of today, and we always have those few stragglers at the end. So just remember, uh, those of you that are involved in your local chapters, this is the time of the year when we have nominations, and we're starting to look for officers for next year. The CSI Next Chapter is doing the same thing. So if you do us a favor and raise your hand if you're interested, make sure you contact your local president to do the best that you can. This is trade show season, uh, so be aware of that. At the end of this presentation, there will be a survey that pops up. Please stay on the line and fill it out so that you can uh, get credit for this meeting. So with that, I'll introduce the speaker, if you'd be so kind. Today's, today's meeting, uh, we're pleased to have Lori Green with the Doran Hardware Association, Doran Hardware Institute. She's going to be giving a presentation on code changes affecting classroom doors. And we're thrilled to have her. If you have not had a chance to look at her ID hardware information and website, please go to that and find it. And with that, Lori, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I think you just said that I was in Michigan, but really I'm in Mexico. So it's a lot warmer and sunnier here. So um, I'm gonna go, going to forward through a few slides that are our AIA required slides, um, and then we'll get to the presentation. So this presentation does qualify for AIA continuing education credit. Uh, so I'll get a list of everyone who participated at the end and I'll get that all registered. Um, it also has DHI and ICC credit. I don't think any of you probably need that, but it's registered for those as well. So I am Lori Green. Uh, I actually work for Allegion. Um, I work with other industry organizations like the Builders Hardware Manufacturers Association, the Door and Hardware Institute, the Door Security and Safe Security and Safety Foundation. Um, but my actual job, the people that pay me are Allegion. And my job is um, called Manager Codes and Resources. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that, well, basically I created the job myself because this was a need that I really saw among the door and hardware industry, but also architects, end users, um, code officials, everyone. Everyone needs code information. And um, so it's been really a great thing to be able to put that out there and have people be able to come to me as a resource. So my role means that I'm responsible for support and training on building codes, fire codes, and accessibility standards related to door opening. So it's a niche, it's a very small niche, but it's my niche, or at least I like to think it is anyway. Um, so basically anything you wanna know about doors or hardware, you can ask me, usually I can figure out the answer or find someone who knows it. Um, I also work in code development, so in the olden days, our, our industry, my industry, the hardware industry, would wait and see what the new additions of the codes brought to us that would affect us. And at some point, it was probably, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, BHMA, representing the manufacturers, decided, hey, we need to get involved here and start to make some of the changes to the codes. So that they would be easier to interpret. There were a lot of like inconsistencies. And so we've done a lot of work to clean some of that up. And I have a running wish list of other things that we need to work on. So the reason that I'm involved with school security is basically because some of the methods that are being proposed as school security solutions aren't compliant with the model codes. So I try to teach people what the model codes require, why they, they require that, because that's a big problem is thinking the codes are just, you know, some old books <laughs> that don't really matter anymore. So I do a lot of education around that and um, I'll talk more about all of that. I do wanna mention if you have questions, I'm going to try to save some time for Q&A at the end. So you can type them in the Q&A box and I think Cindy is going to pick some, of, some that maybe several people have or something to ask me at the end. 
So I've only got a short amount of time today, so I'm going to touch on some of the key issues around classroom security, and then I'll save some time for Q&A at the end. So for our learning objectives today, hopefully we're going to become familiar with the requirements of the model codes and accessibility standards that apply to classroom doors. Um, we'll understand more about how recent code changes and state legislation can impact the types of security devices that might be chosen on some of your projects. Um, we'll, talk, we'll consider the various risks that are faced by school districts and the benefits of using an all hazards approach for security. Um, we'll look at the, some of the options that school districts should consider for securing classroom doors and then maybe some that they should think about what unintended consequences could happen if they choose those devices. Um, and at the end of the webinar, I'll show you to where to find some more information um, on my website, which is idighardware.com. But don't go there right now because you might get lost for a while. So go later. Um, okay, so classroom doors, when we look at school security, we, we have to look at this, the facility in layers. We have the, the exterior, the interior. We, we can compartmentalize the interior. We have to think about perimeter fencing and all of that. But the classroom doors are really a critical point of security, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And then even within the classroom door opening, the lock is not the only component to consider. We have to think about the glazing, the key distribution, um, procedures and drills, and other things. I mean, there's so many different facets of the, secure, the school security and safety, you know, diamond. Um, but I'm just going to focus on the hardware for now. And the main point here is that any security device that's used on a classroom door has to be compliant with the adopted codes for the school's jurisdiction. Some classroom doors are also fire doors as well as egress doors, so, so that adds kind of another layer onto it. And then we have to consider state and federal accessibility requirements also. And a few states have passed laws to remove some of these requirements for classroom doors so that other types of retrofit security products can be used, but I think that's really a short-sighted approach considering everything that has gone into the codes and the standards. And you know, if we just start taking those things out of the codes and standards, we lose some of the protection that we have for building occupants. Uh, so far, there are four states that I can think of that have changed their state laws and, and or their codes. And then there are a few other bills currently in progress. So what happens often is uh, a school will buy a certain type of security device and they may not be aware that that device doesn't comply with their local codes and then they end up trying to change the laws in order to remove some requirements from the codes. So I'm working on bills in several different states. Um, we are, I'm, I'm, we're not proposing the bills, our industry isn't proposing the bills, but when the bills are proposed, we are constantly watching those to make sure that there are at least some safety features within the bill to kind of counterbalance the fact that they're going around the codes in some cases. So just to illustrate what happens if we're not involved is on the screen now. Um, this example is from Arkansas and Arkansas was the first state to pass a bill like this. And the interesting thing about this process in Arkansas uh, was that one of the state legislators was part owner of a company that manufactures classroom barricades. Um, and it was actually a product that was incredibly difficult to remove once it was deployed. So um, the, despite the fact that the state fire marshal got involved, he was also the top law enforcement officer in the state. He was completely against doing this. The bill passed unanimously and became law. So if you look at that law in Arkansas, it's, it says that you can install and use a temporary door barricade device or security lockdown device um, for security purposes basically anywhere you want. It doesn't specify the type of device or the type of facility or how easy it has to be to remove. It just says you can do whatever you want. Um, so luckily 
you know, the the schools in Arkansas have been pretty receptive to hearing and thinking about some of the other potential uh, liabilities and things that they should really consider when they're buying products like this. So we're we're on top of we're on top of the state laws. But if you hear of one, if you hear of a state bill, you can always come to me and I'll. I'll make sure that we are involved. And it's not just we, a legion or me, it's our industry and then some other organizations beyond our industry. Just trying to keep it safe. So I will talk some more about retrofit security in a bit, but I, I want to go over the requirements and some recommendations for classroom security. Um, after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, there was a group that studied that incident and published a final report that included Suggestive, suggested improvements and best practices. And one of their recommendations was that all classrooms should be lockable from the inside by the classroom teachers, including substitute teachers. Um, the day of the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, a teacher who had previously worked at our school, um, I was living in Massachusetts at the time, uh, she had left our school, she's a gym teacher, she left our school and she went to Sandy Hook. So she was there that day and I heard from her some of the, you know, the things that they went through trying to secure their doors. They didn't have the means to secure them. So that's critical that, you know, I, we have to be careful not to go overboard with security. You know, you've heard we don't want to turn schools into prisons and things like that. But there are things that we can do that are like a sufficient level of security for schools. We just have to be realistic and use common sense here. So in addition to the commission's advice, I would also expand on that to say that the whatever they're going to do to secure the doors should be compliant with the building codes, fire codes, and accessibility standards because each state adopts some codes that apply to buildings in those states. And then we also have the federal accessibility standards to think about. So I, I won't go too deep into the codes today because we don't have all day. I could talk to you all day about codes, but that would, you'd pr some people would probably hang up. But um, so there are several codes and standards that apply to classroom doors. I'm sure you're all familiar with them, but basically the adopted building code, the fire code and the accessibility standards, including the ADA. Um, and then states and local jurisdictions often adopt one of these model codes, one or more, like the International Building Code, International Fire Code, or NFPA 1 and the Life Safety Code. And then they might make their own modifications to these codes. So whenever you're working on a project, obviously you need to know which code is being followed um, for this project in this location, which edition of it, and then beyond that, what what do those codes and standards say? Because there have been changes over the last um, few years um, in the, especially in the model codes. So I'm gonna go over those. So generally, so the tough part about this is every code has something a little bit different and something might be present in one code but not in a standard or vice versa. So to figure out what we have to do for classroom doors, we sort of have to layer all the, the stuff together, like a big plate of nachos, you know, put all the, all the requirements together, and this is what we come, out, come up with on the screen. So these are the general requirements. They could vary in a particular state, but this is kind of where we start when we think about a safe classroom. So the door has to unlatch, unlatch with one operation or two. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, no key tool special knowledge or effort must be required for egress. No tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist to operate the hardware. These are all things that have been in the codes for many editions. So this is not new stuff. Um, the releasing hardware has to be between 34 and 48 inches above the floor. Uh, the IBC does have an exception for locks used only for security purposes. So those could be installed at a different height, but the ADA and NFPA 101 don't include that exception. So, you know, if you're, if you have to comply with the ADA, then it kind of negates the exception that's in the IBC. 
Something new that's in the 2018 model codes is that there has to be authorized access from the outside. So if someone locks the door, um, a school staff member, an emergency responder, they can use a key or credential or another means that's been approved by the code official to get into that classroom. It's really, and I'll talk about why that's important in, in a second. Um, panic hardware, I'm sure you all know this as well. If the door is serving 50 occupants or more, the IBC will require panic hardware on those doors. If it's NFPA 101, it's 100 people or more for education and assembly. Um, but we need to be careful with panic hardware. If panic hardware is required, um, and then I have actually seen pictures in the news where they have doors with panic hardware and then they're adding some other type of retrofit device to that. We've probably all seen that somewhere. Uh, it's, it's really scary. You know, anyone could install that device and, and prevent a lot of people from exiting. Uh, the hardware, if it's a fire door, the hardware has to be listed to UL10C and also NFPA 80 limits alterations to fire doors. So if you had a project where it was an existing building, you had existing fire doors, you really have to be careful with what kind of retrofits can be made as far as preparations in the field. Um, what do they have there already? How can we best improve security without violating NFPA 80 um, and violating the listings on those doors. A lot of the newer doors are not fire rated, but some of the old ones are. Uh, another new requirement that is in NFPA 101, it's not in the IBC yet at least, um, it says that uh, the, the classroom doors don't have to be lockable but if they are lockable, they are permitted to be lockable, but the classroom door has to have the capability to be locked from the inside without opening the door. So that will, I'll talk more about that in a second, but one of the common types of locks that you would find on existing schools are traditional classroom function locks where you have to go out into the, the teacher has to go out into the hallway to insert the key or open the door to insert the key in the outside lever. And that would not be allowed by the 2018 edition of NFPA 101. Uh, and then, you know, state and local codes vary, but I'm focusing on the model code requirements today. And then it's up to you to, to see what's going on in your state. Or if you have questions, you can contact me. I have some um, documents, some memos and stuff from different states that say what is allowed for those states. I don't have all of them, but I, I can try to get one if I don't have it and you need it. So TIA 1436, this is something that not everybody knows about yet. Uh, it's a tentative interim amendment that was approved last August to retroactively change NFPA 101 2018. So 2018, the 2018 edition of NFPA 101 said that the locks have to release with one operation, one operation to unlatch the door. So that would be all the latches on the door simultaneously would retract when you turned a lever, for example, or when you pushed on a panic device. So a school district in Maryland, they really wanted to add deadbolts to their doors and so they proposed this tentative interim amendment. It was passed and it retroactively modified NFPA 101, the 2018 edition, to allow two releasing operations. This, so, well, and there are other criteria in the code that can be met. So this is not like anything goes now. This is, you know, you can have two operations, but you have to meet all the other criteria, like the, re the mounting height and things like that. So there are other things in the code that you have to comply with. But when you're specifying hardware for classrooms, it's really important to remember that this change applies only to existing K through 12 schools. And it's only applicable where the 2018 edition of NFPA 101 has been adopted. So don't, don't think like, okay, now I can use deadbolts with my locking hardware and I'm okay. There are very limited places where you can do it. So existing and where NFPA 101 has been adopted. 
Oh, the, the, and the intent was not to allow classroom barricade devices, it was to allow deadbolts, although it does, you know, potentially open the door a little bit to other types of products. So <clears throat> some school administrators, when they're looking for ways to add security quickly and within the budget, and they, they have a lot of pressure from parents often, like, what are, you, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna keep our kids safe? they consider using classroom barricade devices. And I've even heard of these being specified on new schools. We, a legion, we have a hundred and some odd hardware consultants. We will not specify a classroom barricade device. Um, we won't even specify a deadbolt with a separate lock set because we, this TIA that I was just talking about, we weren't behind that. We, even though we sell deadbolts, we could sell a bazillion deadbolts. Someone just asked me yesterday, they had a school where um, the school district wanted to buy 752 deadbolts and just put them on all their classrooms and be done with it. But it wasn't code compliant in that state. And it's just not the right way to do it. So we, we don't do it. Um, you know, you guys have to decide for yourselves, but we won't do it. It's unnecessary and it's not the safest way to go. So this slide shows some conceptual examples of classroom barricade devices. There are literally dozens of products like this on the market now. Um, a lot of them really seem to prioritize security over egress and accessibility, which, you know, it's kind of human nature. Like if the bad guy's outside the door, You'll do anything to secure the door and who cares about egress, who cares about accessibility at that point, but there are so many other potential hazards, so many things that could go wrong. Um, it's real, and it's, and it's not necessary. They probably already have locks. It's kind of just this um, sort of emotional response that has built from some of the things that have happened. So. I just wanna say for the record, I'm not saying that all retrofit security devices or all classroom barricade devices even are not code compliant or that they're not legal to use. I'm not saying that. I do know of a retrofit deadbolt, for example, that attaches to the existing lever handle. Then when you turn the lever handle, it retracts both the latch bolt and the new deadbolt bolt simultaneously. Um, so what I'm saying is that a lot of the devices on the market are not compliant with the model codes and there's really a lot to consider when we're thinking about what to specify on a particular project and what decisions we're making about classroom security. So why are they used? Like what's so attractive? What's wrong with locks? We've had locks all, all along, you know? Why do, why, why, what makes it so attractive to use some other type of device? Um, so you look at them at first glance, it seems like, wow, this is a simple way to secure the door. That's a good option. They're probably less expensive than buying new locks. Although sometimes an existing lock function, if it's not the right fit, it can be changed using a conversion kit. Sometimes that actually costs less. Um, the, the barricade, the retrofit devices, they're easy to order online. Unlike traditional door hardware, which I'm sure you guys will probably agree, it can be pretty complex. Nobody wants to mess with it. Like who wants to rekey or look at every lock and see what needs to be changed? Um, the retrofit devices, they can be installed by carpenters rather than needing to get a security professional involved. Uh, a lot of the marketing is based on emotion. They'll show you know, someone, they'll show like a simulated school shooting or they'll show, show, show a police officer trying to beat down the door um, where there's a barricade device installed, which makes you feel like, oh yeah, it's really secure. No one's gonna be able to get in and get at my kid. But my question is, you know, I have three teenagers and things, crazy things happen at school some days. And if an unauthorized person uses a, a device to secure a door and the police can't get in with a sledgehammer, what happens then? Um, there have actually been at least three school shootings where someone, the assailant has brought materials in from home to barricade the doors and prevented or d delayed law enforcement response. So it's a, that's a real concern for me, is just the unauthorized use. So 
I get it when, when school administrators are under this pressure to increase security, they see like the, the next district over, they've incorporated some security measures. They feel like, well, now we look like we're not doing the right thing. So they want to do something, right? They want to do anything that's going to increase, uh, make it look like they're increasing security. But a lot of times it's a false sense of security. Um, like I said, they probably already have locks and who really knows how good these devices or any particular product is if it's untested and basically unregulated. So what's the problem? Um, why do you need to really think about the different options and, and what they could mean? So in addition to the code related concerns, um, <clears throat> certain types of devices can deter or prevent evacuation. They can even increase lockdown time. They could be installed by an unauthorized person and they could prevent school staff and emergency responders from entering the room. I was listening to one webinar with um, someone from NFPA and he's an emergency responder and he was, he was saying like, if I can't get in, I can't save you, you know, if you're injured. And he was really passionate about it. It was a really good um, webinar that he did. <clears throat> so, statistics on school violence, uh, these statistics really come as a surprise to a lot of people, but I think they really well illustrate one of the major concerns. So we hear about school shootings all the time, the, what we hear on the news, it makes it seem like they're really common. They are actually very rare. Um, so between 2013 and 2017, the FBI reported an average of four active shooter incidents in educational occupancies per year. And everyone, when you look at the stats, there are different ways to count these things, count incidents of gun violence, um, you know, is a suicide the same as an active shooter? It isn't. You know, is an incident at the football game the same as something that occurs in the classroom? It's, it's really not. So the FBI says four active shooter incidents, and they're saying all, it's all educational occupancies, just not, not just K through 12 schools. So we obviously need to prepare and plan and think about active shooter incidents, and I, I'm not at all minimizing how serious school shootings are, but we just can't ignore the other hazardous situations that might occur in schools. So I think I already said one of the major concerns that I have about barricade devices is that they could be used by an unauthorized person. They could be used during another type of crime. So the second statistic on this slide is according to the National Center for Education Statistics, in 2017, so in one year, students aged 12 to 18 experienced 827,000 incidents of crime in school. So that's theft, assault, sexual assault in schools. So <laughs> in one year. So clearly that illustrates to me that there's a potential for a barricade device to be used to secure a room and delay access um, to the people that can help. And there have been other incidents of barricading and hostage taking. There was a study, um, I think the study was maybe in like 2007 or eight or something like that. And it studied 19 incidents of barricading and hostage taking in schools. So this is, you know, I just get worried about giving someone the tools to barricade the door where before they would have to bring something in or, or figure out a way to barricade the door. And rather now we're kind of in some schools, they're giving them that ability right there hanging next to the door. So with the incidence of crime, the point there is that authorized access is a really important consideration. And that's why it was added to the 2018 model codes that we have to be able to get in. Someone has to be able to get in from the outside. Um, in addition to the potential liability of installing something that might not be code compliant, there's a possibility that the devices would have to be removed. Um, there was a college in California that installed more than $200,000 worth of barricade devices that didn't comply with the state codes, and then they were all ordered removed by the fire marshal. So I, I wouldn't want to be the person who made that decision, for sure. 
some, uh, when we talk about locking schools and, and barricade devices, some proponents of barricade devices have said that the fire codes really aren't important anymore. Um, security is more important because we don't have fatal fires in schools anymore, which there is some truth to that. The, we, we really don't have fatalities like we used to. I mean, there could be schools with dozens or even close to 100 fatalities in a school fire. Um, in the past. So think about, let's think about what's changed over time. So <clears throat> uh, remember the FBI statistic of four shootings per year in educational occupancies. And according to NFPA, there, there's an av there are an average of, there is an average of 4,859 fires per year in educational occupancies. So the fires are still occurring almost 5,000 times a year the fires are occurring. But the reason that we don't see the fatalities is because of the strength of the codes, the code changes that have been made over the last 100 years. And without them, we would probably still be seeing some of those high fatality fires in schools because what else has changed? The fires are still happening. You know, it's just a safer environment because of the codes. The same report from NFPA says, because this is another argument, um, is another point that's made sometimes is, well, all the schools have sprinkler systems, so the kids can just shelter in place and they're not gonna be in danger. But the same report from NFPA says that of those fires that they studied during that period, only 39% of the schools were equipped with sprinkler systems. So it's not accurate to say we're okay, those kids are okay, they've got sprinklers in every school. <clears throat> so I, one of the ways that, um, mar that marketing happens with security products is to focus on the perceived likelihood of a school shooting. Um, we had a little girl move in across the street from us. She was from Austin, Texas. And like I said, we live in Mexico, scary Mexico. And she said to my 13 year old, she's also 13, um, that when she lived in Austin, she had a one in 900 chance of being shot in a school shooting every day, which obviously is not true, but that's what our kids hear. That's what parents hear from the media. Um, so I saw these two great articles in the Washington Post about um, how rare school shootings actually are, and then another one about lockdown drills. And both of these articles are linked. I'll show you where to find them um, if you want to read more. But one of the statistics that I thought was interesting was the statistical likelihood of any given public school student being killed by a gun in school on any given day since 1999 was roughly one in 614 million. Um, I'll, I'll, those seem like pretty pretty good odds to me. And I, I really like statistics and I always talk to my friends about school security and I pull out my statistics and they're always you know, amazed by, by some of this stuff. So in one of the, in the second article from the Washington Post, there were some statistics that I thought were really interesting and really something for us to think about when we're trying to decide how to secure a school. So more, more children have died from lightning strikes than from mass shootings in schools in the past 20 years. It's 10 times more likely that a student will die on the way to school. Obviously, we don't like to talk about any students dying, but we're still taking them to school, right? Even though there's some element of danger there uh, on the way. Restaurants have 10 times as many homicides as schools and our chances of dying in a fire, uh, this is all occupancy, occupancy types, not just schools. Our chances of dying are one in 1500. So it's a, much more likely that we will die in a fire sometime in our life um, than be killed in a school shooting as a student. So it's just really critical that we balance both security and safety when we're looking to secure classrooms. Just to touch on the lock functions a little bit, um, and this, this um, infographic is also available, um, and I'll show you where to find it. People always ask me like, what's your favorite function? <laughs> well, I don't really have a favorite lock function. I have a favorite finish, but that's a different story. So um, in the past, 
the traditional classroom function was the most common. That's the one that where you have to open the door to use your key to lock it. That can obviously expose a teacher to danger. Some school districts, if they have that type of locks, they will set a policy to keep the doors locked all the time. So the teacher could just close the door to lock it. This can be inconvenient uh, when someone needs to enter the classroom during class, but it's kind of a good measure that they could take that doesn't cost anything and buys them some time until they decide what they want to do. So the most common lock functions that are used now are either the classroom security function, the entrance office function or the storeroom function if they're using mechanical locks. And really that depends on how the school wants to lock their classroom doors. Do they want everyone to be able to lock it and they so they want a thumb turn or a push button? Do they want them to be always, always locked every time the door is closed? That would be a storeroom function. Or do they want to control that with the key? and have the teachers be the only ones who can lock it, that would be a classroom security function. So there are pros and cons to each, and really it's up to how the school wants to lock their doors. I mean, as specifiers or as architects, you can explain the different choices, but ultimately they just have to tell us how they want them to work, and then we can help them get the right function. The other thing to consider here is that some states or local ju jurisdictions might require or prohibit a certain lock function. So for example, Florida's Department of Education requirements say all doors shall be equipped with lock sets that are not lockable from inside of the space, which is interesting, but it goes on to have to include an exception for classroom security function. So basically their guidelines are saying they don't want everyone and anyone to be able to lock the door. They want the teacher to be able to lock the door with the key. So, and different, different jurisdictions have different sets of requirements. So you just have to know what's required or allowed in any particular location. Indicators, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. They're, it's, it's obvious, uh, I think, what they do show the position of the hardware, whether it's locked or unlocked, but this can be something that can be really helpful to include in a specification um, so that the teachers know, yes, I successfully locked that door and we are safe in here during our lockdown. Conversion kits, um, I mentioned them, I think a while ago. There are conversion kits for mortise locks and classroom uh, and cylindrical locks where if the lock has a function where you have to open the door to lock it, you can convert it to a different function um, depending on the manufacturer and things like that. So there's a link to a video that one of my coworkers made showing how to change the function of a mortise lock and add an indicator. This could be something that would be worth specifying for some of your existing projects, existing school projects where they need to change the function from one to the next. They may not need all new locks. Uh, why not use magnets? I, I know none of you guys are specifying magnets on strikes, so I won't go too far into this, but um, a magnet on a strike prevents the door from latching. You might see these in some existing schools. Um, they're not allowed on fire doors. The, the, outs, the way it works is the outside lever is kept locked all the time. And so basically the lock is just never latching. It's always locked, but it doesn't latch. So there was actually a situation um, at a school shooting where the affidavit of, the, of what happened said that the student pulled the magnetic strip on the door and pulled it shut so it couldn't be open from the outside. And then that same student commenced with his shooting within that classroom. So the problem with that, the problem with the magnet is, uh, well, there are several. Um, fire doors are a problem. You have to open the door to remove the magnet, albeit only a little. But if the teachers are not used to carrying their keys because the doors aren't really locked, then if someone does pull out the magnet and latch the door, it's gonna take a little bit of time for them to find the key and get the doors open. Electrified locks, again, I won't go into it in depth, 
if a school's budget allows, um, especially in higher ed, um, a lot of times they're going, colleges and universities are going to electrified locks. Uh, they can be a great option if none of the mechanical functions are exactly the right fit. And if there's money in the budget for electrified locks, there are disadvantage, I mean, there are advantages to them. You can lock them, you can lock down the whole building if you want um, at the touch of a button. The disadvantage, um, since I just almost said disadvantage, I'll say really the only disadvantage that I can think of is the cost and the complexity. You know, the school has to be on board for both of those things. And the, they are allowed by the model codes. The 2018 model codes actually have a specific line that um, addresses remote unlocking, remote locking of classroom doors. Um, so if the locks are doors are locked remotely, they have to be unlocked from within, unlockable from within the classroom for egress. So basically you can't lock down the whole place and not let anyone leave their classroom. One question that comes up a lot is whether it's a good idea to use mag locks for school security because they're pretty easy to retrofit and then you could push a button and lock all the doors, you know, simultaneously. Um, it, a mag lock is basically an electromagnet in a housing, and when you apply power to it, it bonds to a steel armature to lock the door. I don't, re I don't recommend uh, mag locks for school applications because when you add in all of the release devices that are required to make them code compliant, they're a lot less cost effective. Um, and also, if you use the type of mag lock that has a motion sensor, then if someone steps into the field of that motion sensor, they could unlock the door and accidentally let someone in. Um, some people think they can just add a mag lock and that lock will stay locked until someone decides to unlock it um, by cutting power to it and that that would not be code compliant. I did see a state uh, fire code, it's in Georgia, that does allow cross corridor doors to have mag locks and kind of like to trap the intruder. I don't, um, I, I'm not an advocate for that. I just don't think... I think the likelihood of that being used incorrectly is a lot higher than actually trapping someone. So I don't, I don't agree with that idea. Delayed egress, I just want to mention because the 2018 IBC does have two changes for delayed egress and delayed egress allows you to prevent the door from opening for 15 seconds. There are, there's some other criteria in the code that has to be met. Um, these devices were not allowed on assembly or educational occupancies until the 2018 edition. And now they are allowed on classroom doors serving less than 50 occupants if, if the other criteria are met. Um, and then there's also a change that has to do with the secondary exit in courtrooms. Those can also have delayed egress locks if certain criteria are met in that case as well. So as I said at the beginning, um, there are other criteria, other considerations that we have to think about. It's not just the lock set. Uh, for example, the glass near the hardware may need to be changed to glazing with more impact resistance or a film that can be added to make it more difficult to break the glass. We have seen some school shootings where the glass was broken in order to reach through and turn the lever or for someone to just walk through the broken glass. So that's something as a specifier, uh, I would really consider and talk to the school, the school administrators and say, you know, how do we best handle this? Um, there are different products available to increase that impact resistance. So I'm getting to the end here. So think of your questions if you have any. Um, but the bottom line here is that whatever locks you're specifying, they do have to provide the needed level of security as well as allowing free egress. Um, lock sets, any commercial lock set that you would be specifying is going to be listed for use on fire doors. Um, it's going to meet the ADA requirements. It's going to allow free egress. There's even a BHMA standard to show whether a lock uh, is um, compliant with the requirement for one motion egress. And 
a lot of the retrofit products, they're untested. They're, we don't know how they will actually perform. Um, they don't go through any of the standards, the testing and standards that um, other security products do. So just have to be careful if you are asked to specify something like that. So sometimes people think locks aren't strong enough. Um, the final report of the Sandy Hook Advisory Commission stated that um, there had never been an event in which an active shooter breached a locked classroom door. I don't know of one since then. They have been breached in some cases by breaking the glass, but not by shooting the lock off, which is, you know, the, the kind of thing that you hear about in the movies. And then I just like to end with this um, quote from a student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. And in that shooting, locked doors definitely saved lives. And so one of the students said in an interview that the school had a policy to keep the doors locked. So they actually had traditional classroom function locks where you have to open the door, put the key in the outside lever, um, and they kept the doors locked. So those locked doors meant that the teacher never, I mean, the sorry, the shooter never entered a classroom. So there were other things that happened that day that led to a high loss of life, but the locks did protect the students that were in the classroom. So we have, let's see, 12 minutes for Q&A. Um, I don't know, Cindy, if you can talk now. <laughs> can, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, I haven't gotten any questions, so I'm gonna unmute everybody and I, well, if you have a question, let's let's hear it. Yeah. Okay, everybody's unmuted. Okay, somebody must have a question. Don't be shy. <laughs> well, one question that came up at a webinar, I, a lot of questions came up at a webinar that I did last week, about 60 on this topic. So um, while you're thinking of your questions, I will tell you that someone had a question of, are there any barricade devices that are code compliant? And I will say, yes, there are. So it's all, it all has to do with marketing and what is being called a barricade device, right? But there's a, there's a retrofit deadbolt that's available. Um, and that is being marketed as a barricade device, but it's, it's a piece of hardware. And because the retrofit deadbolt attaches to the lever handle, when you turn the lever handle, both the, the latch bolt and the deadbolt retract with one operation. So that's, that's perfectly code compliant. It's listed for use on fire doors and doesn't require extensive preparation on the door. So I don't have any problem with that particular product. And then there's another one that I know of that's sort of like a retrofit deadbolt. Again, um, it's surface mounted and it complies in locations where you can have two releasing operations. Um, if it was a location where it was only one operation was allowed, it, in my opinion, it wouldn't be compliant. But, and then you have to look at different states because, um, this would or would not be um, compliant and we go through it we go through the product and some he has approved a couple so um i don't know everyone's excited now maybe because it's time to go home but i can hear all of you does anyone have a question okay Lori. yep excellent webinar thank you very very much uh, you are welcome. You are, you are a rock star. We don't normally get this kind of quality. And just let me say, I did one of these a couple months ago. So that shows you how far down we went. So now <laughs> we've seen the top of the mountain. I was in the foothills. Uh, we really, really appreciate you giving us your expertise. What an excellent webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. For thank those of you, you on the call, uh, just remember next year or next month in April, April 2nd, we'll be with Bear giving us some more information about paint. Uh, for those of you on the call, you can end the call now. Feel free to hang up and wait for the survey that comes out from Zoom. It should pop up on your screen. 
And then we look forward to hearing what you thought about this webinar. Thanks again. Okay, and if anyone's still listening, there is a page that has all of the resources that I talked about in the webinar, any, um, any uh, article or report or whatever, it's on the page that's called idighardware.com slash webinars, and you'll find everything there, including um, a sign up for another webinar if you're interested in learning about Panic Hardware. So thank you all for attending.